Yeah. Welcome everyone to today's uh, endocrinology grand rounds. And um, today we are um, pleased to have Dr. Robert Hunter uh, talk to us on the topic uh, current conceptions on infertility. Uh, Dr. Hunter um, is um, did his uh, residency uh, in OBGYN at uh, Staten Island and then did a fellowship here at the University of Louisville in reproductive endocrinology and infertility and um, has been uh, practicing here in Louisville. He also uh, has an appointment in the uh, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He is the medical director of the um, uh, Kentucky Fertility Institute and um, uh, he, our fellows have had the opportunity to go and work with him, um, you know, see uh, and learn about uh, how to work up infertility, uh, which is an important topic for us uh, to uh, uh, address as we see many of our patients um, with um, endocrine disorders. Um, so he has uh, given several lectures on this topic and uh, we are happy to have him here talk uh, on this today. Thank sure, you. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thanks everybody for having me. It's uh, good to be back. It's been years since I've done one of these. Hope, hope that doesn't show too, uh, too obviously. But uh, it was a, a fun task to present a talk just on infertility, which is, uh, took me you know, three years and all my uh, years since then to learn and condense into an hour. So we'll, we'll see how that works out. Uh, the well, um, something should be happening. I, do I click the mouse? No. How do I advance? Arrow? Thanks. Uh, I like to think I'm clicking the button. Make sure the cursor is actually somewhere inside the PowerPoint. Okay, no. Well. One of these. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay, cool. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah. So here are the learning objectives today. You know, I was kind of anticipating this being largely a non-gynecological audience. So just to define infertility, make sure we understand what is infertility, what is not infertility, and when to initiate a workup, when to initiate referral, uh, just because I think that'll be important for um, the majority of you here. Uh, understanding um, the typical diagnostic strategies that we use clinically to work up an infertile patient or couple. And also just a basic understanding of the types of therapies we have available and how we approach um, treating infertility. Uh, I do have a couple of disclosures. I do some consulting for Hologic, uh, which makes medical devices, surgical equipment, and then uh, we will be discussing off-label use of letrozole. Uh, so starting off again, just kind of talking about the definition of infertility. I think uh, one of those things where in order to understand what is abnormal, of course we have to understand first what is normal. and then, um, I think it's important to know that our, our reproductive systems are inherently inefficient. Uh, it's something that uh, whoever designed us, um, uh, maybe, maybe some room for improvement, certainly with our reproductive systems, but uh, conception rates are um, rarely what we want them to be clinically. And this table shows um, typical rates of conception in a normally fertile couple over different intervals of time. And so you can kind of see mouse works, um, you know, a year we only expect 85% of couples to uh, have conceived by uh, normal normal efforts, which is part of where our definition of 12 months of trying uh, leading to a 15% incidence of infertility comes from. But uh, again, I think certainly for counseling's sake, uh, if you've seen a couple that's only been trying for a handful of months, it's important to be uh, aware that, that, they, um, that they do have uh, appropriate expectations of normal conception rates. Um, you know, timing intercourse is important for couples trying to conceive. Um, fertilization happens in the fallopian tube uh, shortly after ovulation, and so it's important for sperm to be there when the egg is released. And so um, you can see some tables here just showing a single act of intercourse, uh, how likely that is to lead to conception. And generally, there's a six-day window with a meaningful chance of uh, conception occurring that essentially leads up to ovulation. Once ovulation occurs, that window quickly closes. And so, um, you know, again, this is something clinically a lot of us are aware of. Patients may not be. And so just to make sure they're aware of when they're most likely to conceive, this table on the bottom shows uh, just without knowing when ovulation occurs. If you're just looking at cycle days, 
most most women ovulate around day 14, and so you can see uh, the data we mentioned previously kind of reflected here, where a single active intercourse most likely to lead to conception towards the middle of a menstrual cycle, but there will, of course, be some variability, um, you know, reflecting patient variability of, of when they're actually ovulating. I'm stuck again. There we go. Okay. So this is, um, you know, another uh, just important uh, set of data to be aware of. I often refer to this as the graph of why I have a job. Um, and women, uh, their fertility peaks in their early 20s, and it only declines after that. By age 30, women have roughly a 20% chance of conceiving per month. By 40, that drops down to 5%. And that just progressive decline, you know, we'll have to call normal. It's not that there's anything pathological. Again, this just reflects the way um, our species was designed. And, and so I think for, um, you know, patients trying to conceive, there may be other issues working against them, but um, you know, this is always a factor also. Wherever they are in this graph kind of sets the framework for future discussions. So I think this is uh, always important to have in mind when we're evaluating a uh, patient with infertility. And so here's um, what ASRM uses as their definition of infertility. Uh, it's a disease historically defined by failure to achieve pregnancy after 12 months or more of regular unprotected intercourse uh, due to an impairment of the person's capacity to reproduce. Uh, either as an individual or as a um, or with their partner, and so that's kind of our classic definition. Uh, they also highlight that infertility is a disease which generates disability. And I think that's just something that you know both within our field and certainly when you start adding in insurance factors, social factors, um, you know we sometimes have to fight to uh, justify infertility as a disease. But certainly all of us who are on the front lines of, of seeing it every day. I think uniformly agree that infertility is indeed a disease that adversely affects our patient's quality of life. Um, ASRM recommends diagnostic testing uh, be started right away for individuals or couples that have identifiable risk factors for infertility. Patients with um, irregular cycles, uh, risk for tubal disease, uterine factor, risk for male factor, you know, all of these things we talk about, 12 months, six months, whatever, you know, that's only in couples with uh, with an unremarkable medical history, but you know, don't make a woman who doesn't have menstrual cycles wait 12 months to come see us. Uh, for a patient like that, uh, workup should be started right away. But in absence of historical findings, uh, again, our classic definitions are to start a workup at 12 months when the woman is under age 35, six months uh, for women over 35, and then in women 40 or more, uh, generally we'd want to see those patients right away. Um, and so again, we kind of saw some uh, data earlier that, that helps understand why infertility is defined in about 10 to 15 percent of couples. At 12 months, 85 percent of normal couples should have conceived by that time. So that leaves about 15 that are going to meet this diagnosis. And that's pretty true worldwide. That's not a United States um, metric. That's pretty clear um, you know, around the, the world in all sorts of different populations, uh, first world, second world, developing world. Uh, it's it's um, pretty static. Um, the incidence of infertility is not increasing. I think that's something that some people, um, um, you know, have mis misconceptions about. But um, there, we, we're talking about it a lot more, right? I mean, we do have some demographic changes that make it seem like infertility um, is increasing. Certainly, uh, a lot of our, our treatments are improving. We have better abilities to help women conceive into their 30s and 40s now. Um, that have allowed patients to have greater prognosis who face infertility. Um, again, there are women just in general who are attempting pregnancy at later ages now than we used to see. And uh, I think there's just more attention, certainly in the media, social media, um, popular press, celebrities. Uh, I think there are a lot of different uh, facets where we're seeing more conversations about infertility, which is a good thing. But, um, but I think that kind of leads to the misperception that infertility is increasing overall. Uh, birth rate, however, is decreasing. That's something that's held pretty true uh, since the post-war period. Um, and that's that's where we see women um, uh, delaying childbearing due to advancing education and careers, uh, getting married at later ages, more frequent divorce, uh, more contraception, more family planning accessibility, um, and in general, just uh, people desiring smaller uh, family sizes than they used to. And so again, that's a little different than a 
increase in infertility, but it is true that our birth rate is going down as a nation. Uh, and so here's just another way of looking at the normal decline of female fertility with aging. Um, you know, these are pretty common looking graphs for our field. Um, you know, this one in blue shows the decline of fertility uh, by age, which again is just normal. Uh, and that, that's synthesized from all sorts of different um, you know, research um, sources, ranging from IVF treatments to natural fertility and, um, and you know, relatively less civilized populations that don't have access to contraception. Um, we also in orange see a um, uh, correlating increase in miscarriage rates. And so that's something where, particularly for women that are in later reproductive years, there's, there's something of a, a double-edged sword working against them where conception rates are gonna be lower and then miscarriage rates are gonna be uh, uh, increasingly more common. And so that just, uh, particularly in women in later reproductive years, makes fertility um, more difficult to attain. Um, there are a couple reasons for these uh, phenomenon. One is that uh, we run out of eggs, and so women are born with every egg they'll ever have. I've always liked looking at this graph because I think normally we're used to seeing graphs that just show this little tail end of the, of the, um, of, of the graph here. But um, you know, if you really go back to uh, when women are born, or even back when they're a fetus developing inside their mom, um, their number of eggs peaks uh, in the mid-second trimester. And so um, the, the order of magnitude of eggs that women are born with or that they have when they start puberty is quite different than what they peaked um, prior to birth. And really the um, you know, decline from the 400,000 or so at puberty to uh, what you have at, at menopause is relatively smaller in terms of magnitude. But um, you know, that said, current thinking is that we only have uh, as many eggs as you'll ever have at the time you're, you're born. The rate women exhaust their egg supply varies, and so that's something that we can measure with ovarian reserve testing. But, um, uh, but you know, this is something that right now we don't have an easy cure for. Uh, the thought is that uh, ovarian supply is supported by the primordial follicular pool. And so as you start running through your uh, supply of eggs and more and more go, undergo atresia, you have an accelerated loss that occurs in the late 30s and 40s um, that's, uh, I think, reflected in some of these other graphs we've seen. Here, just on the scale of this graph, you don't really see that typical decline after age 35 that we're probably more used to seeing in other graphics. Uh, there's some characteristic uh, endocrine changes that occur with reproductive aging. I think a lot of people are familiar with the monotropic FSH rise that occurs. Uh, this is something, again, as we're losing our follicular pool, losing the um, feedback inhibition from uh, follicles at the level of the ovary, uh, we're going to release FSH from uh, inhibin and estrogen's inhibitory signals that allows kind of a higher um, relative level of FSH at the intercycle transition and early follicular phase that we can measure. And so that's one of the ways we can measure uh, ovarian reserve, and we see that higher FSH levels tend to correlate with lower remaining numbers of follicles. Um, due to that, because you get this accelerated rise in FSH, uh, you tend to recruit your follicles faster. So you have a shorter follicular phase, that'll lead to an overall shorter cycle length that um, higher FSH tone can also cause more follicles to develop, uh, which leads to a higher incidence of dizygotic twinning for women in their 40s. And typically around age 42 is where cycle length reaches a minimum. After that, we start seeing more of the perimenopausal transition, typically lasting five to six years until an average age of menopause um, at 51 in this country. And then there are also changes that are very important at the level of the oocyte. So looking at eggs and how they change over time uh, with aging, again, if we're born with every egg we'll have, you know, by the time you're ovulating in your 40s, you know, those eggs are all 40 years old. And particularly, the meiotic spindles that regulate um, the eggs preparation for fertilization are going to be more subject to error. And so we start seeing more incidents of aneuploidy within oocytes and within the embryos that result from them, 
for women with increasing age. And so this graph probably looks familiar from what we looked at before with uh, fertility declining and miscarriage increasing, but now we're looking at different outcomes. So now this is number of follicles declining, and you can see that as your follicles decline, the oocytes that remain tend to be more and more abnormal as women age. And so this age-related decline uh, in fertility and the increase in miscarriage we've talked about previously are largely attributed to the increase in the proportion of abnormal oocytes in a woman's aging and shrinking follicular pool over time. And so I think really that genetic factor is uh, one that maybe a lot of people aren't aware of, but certainly uh, very prevalent in our clinical day-to-day -day lives. And so with that background, we can talk about how we diagnose um, infertility. Um, just to kind of revisit whom, whom to evaluate, again, we've got our typical definitions, women under 35 at 12 months, over 35 at 6 months, over 40 we'd love to see immediately. And then again, any women or couples that have identifiable risk factors that are associated with infertility, uh, ranging from irregular cycles to suspected uterine tubal disease, uh, known history of endometriosis, risk factors for male subfertility, any sort of sexual dysfunction, um, other acquired um, uh, risk factors for diminished ovarian reserve, um, or any sort of genetic risk factor. It's something where we don't want to make these couples wait a fixed amount of time uh, just, just so they can clear that hurdle. Um, there may also be some patients who don't technically have infertility that we'll want to see sooner, patients with recurrent pregnancy loss who are getting pregnant, just not staying pregnant. Uh, women or couples that have known genetic risk factors for monogenetic disorders that may be indications for certain types of fertility treatment. Um, women or couples that have uh, indications for donor sperm utilization or uh, use of a gestational carrier. And so all of those, again, it's not necessarily going to make sense to require a certain amount of efforts before referring for a workup. Uh, of course, all workups are going to start with a typical H&P, and so I'm not sure if y'all can read that table, but these are some of the typical things we look for in our history and physical examination, typically uh, menstrual cycle history, past obstetric history, uh, including complications from prior deliveries, uh, sexual history, family history, genetic risk factors, anything like that may be relevant as we kind of start looking um, for what our, our causes of infertility can be. Our initial visits with patients are always a good time to, um, you know, look at overall pre-pregnancy care, uh, whether genetic screening may be uh, indicated if that hasn't previously been performed, make sure that health maintenance screening is up to date, um, just for whatever the patient's age-based screening um, recommendations would be. And then, of course, physical exam will look at signs of endocrinopathy, gynecologic pathologies, things like that. It is recommended to do male and female evaluations together um, when a male partner is present. So we always try to meet with couples um, together at their initial visit whenever possible, and diagnostic workup should um, more or less proceed in, in parallel. Um, the way we approach diagnosis of infertility, um, you know, we, sh we want to be sy systematic, expeditious, and cost-effective. Um, you know, I think paying attention to what may have um, come out of a patient's history and physical evaluations, making sure we're kind of focusing our testing, uh, particularly in a cost-effective way, um, but also reflecting patients' uh, preferences in this. This is something that, you know, patients certainly bring a lot of, um, you know, uh, their own personal preconceptions and things to these meetings, and so just making sure we're, we're taking things at a pace they're going to be comfortable with that's uh, respective of, um, of their, their wishes as we move forward, both with their diagnosis and treatment. But again, we will want to evaluate both partners uh, concurrently when a male partner is present. Uh, this is a graph. Um, I think we see a lot of variations of this graph in our field, just showing um, common causes of infertility. Um, and so maybe if we pay attention more to the one on the left that in includes uh, heterosexual couples, um, you know, first let's not ignore the male factor. I think that's just something where um, a lot of times infertility is perceived more as a woman's issue, but certainly in practice we see a very high incidence of male contributing factors, sometimes exclusive male problems. And so again, just the um, importance of, sc of screening both partners together. 
Uh, but when you look at other causes of infertility, certainly ovulatory dysfunction is very common, uh, issues with tubal, uterine, pelvic pathology, very common. And then we do see a, um, a meaningful percentage of cases that are left unexplained um, despite a thorough evaluation. Um, I've never really liked those graphs, and, and this is kind of how um, I like to think of infertility, how I, uh, I guess, learned to, to diagnose it, and, and a lot of the way I kind of conceptualize um, how I treat it. And then just in my mind, I kind of like to follow the path of sperm as it looks for an egg, and kind of just think along the way, what are the potential barriers to normal fertility? And so kind of following that path, if we start with the sperm itself, with male factor, you know, I like to kind of think um, what sorts of things could be inhibiting the uh, function of sperm itself. And so, of course, you know, we'll want to think about abnormal sperm parameters, sexual dysfunction, couples unable to time intercourse normally. Uh, you may have cervical factors that inhibit the uh, normal migration of sperm through the cervix into the upper reproductive tract. And so I, um, I think that's where a good infertility evaluation may start. As we move north, um, uterine factors, you'll see a, um, a spectrum of pathologies that may involve the uterus directly that can inhibit fertility. Fibroids, polyps, and intrauterine adhesions are all very common. Um, we'll go over a, a spectrum of congenital anomalies which may be present in our patients. And then endometritis, which is inflammation of the endometrium, the inner layer of the uterus, uh, is also a um, contributing factor for infertility and pregnancy loss we can think about. As we move out, tubal factor, certainly very common. Uh, prior sexually transmitted infections will be a big risk for this. Uh, prior pelvic surgeries, things like a ruptured appendix, uh, complications after C-sections, a lot of things contribute to um, tubal issues, as well as endometriosis, which may cause uh, adhesions and scarring in the pelvis, interfer interfering with the nexal anatomy. And of course, there'll be a lot of factors relating to the ovary itself. Uh, this is where PCOS and other types of ovulatory dysfunction may be factors, diminished reserve, or, or patients with ovarian insufficiency. Uh, this is where age and genetic factors may uh, be most significant. And endometriosis can also be important at the level of the ovary. Uh, other endocrine and metabolic issues may also affect normal ovulatory function. So I, I feel like that's kind of an easy way to um, just conceptualize the workup of infertility. And I think when I'm thinking about it just in real time with patients, a lot of times this graph um, comes to mind. But to kind of walk through each of those just in a little more detail, um, you know, here's just kind of some typical notes on the male factor evaluation. Uh, of course, we want to start with a history. Um, I would say every week I see a guy who's on testosterone and didn't know that that suppresses spermatogenesis. And uh, that's just something that uh, I'm, I'm sure you all uh, uh, have your own opinions of the uh, 25 again and uh, those types of clinics that are just seeming to be increasing out there. But they're, uh, they're great for my business and that's in that they just are sterilizing our men. But, uh, but again, the history of the male is important. Um, a semen analysis is, of course, our gold standard for testing. There is other male testing that may be relevant, but typically we start with a semen analysis for initial screening. And with the abnormalities there, uh, you may want to repeat a semen analysis. There can be transient factors that affect the quality and uh, metrics we see in a single analysis. So always fair to repeat. And then we can uh, consider referral to a reproductive urologist with persistent abnormalities there. Uh, and then also considering cervical dysfunction, uh, cervical issues, uh, perhaps relating to prior cervical surgeries uh, for abnormal pap smears or sexual issues that uh, also may affect delivery of sperm uh, to the reproductive tract when ovulation occurs. Um, moving north to the uterus, um, these are the typical ways we might consider evaluating the uterus. Uh, all have their pros and cons. We'll maybe talk about each briefly, uh, certainly the transvaginal sonogram is kind of the hallmark of how we can quickly evaluate the uterus. It's an easy test, it's a quick test. We get a lot of in information about general uterine architecture with that. A variation of that is called sonohistorography, where we put sterile saline into the uterus to distend the uterine cavity a bit, which gives us superior screening for intracavitary lesions. And so this will be certainly important for patients with infertility who may have issues that affect implantation. Uh, or abnormal bleeding. We'll see a, a very common uh, spectrum of pathologies related to abnormal bleeding uh, with these tests. Hysterosalpingography or HSG analysis um, can be used to image the uterus. It won't be the most specific uh, test for 
um, uterine factors, but uh, can be useful for looking at congenital anomalies. Uh, and then hysteroscopy is a diagnostic surgical um, approach where we put a camera into the uterus and can visualize the endometrium directly. That gives us the option of doing uh, real-time treatment for any pathologies we encounter. Um, this doesn't show us the myometrium. It doesn't show us more global uh, factors related to the uterus, but uh, certainly gives us a, a good look at the endometrium itself. Uh, there can be a role for MRI with certain um, uterine pathologies. I do like doing MRIs on all my um, more advanced fibroid cases that we're going to be planning surgeries on just to help map them out with their location uh, in the uterus. Um, MRI can be useful for adenomyosis um, and certain types of more complex uh, congenital anomalies. And endometrial biopsy can be used for um, certain types of endometrial testing. That can be a way to screen for endometritis, but um, not going to be the most common thing we do. Uh, just to return to the transvaginal sonogram, again, this is probably going to be our, our first line screening for most patients. Uh, this image just shows a normal uh, uterus in two dimensions and then a 3D reconstruction of a coronal plane where you can see just what a normal uterus looks like. Uh, again, this is a very easy test. It's very well tolerated. It's very inexpensive. Um, and so most of us are going to start with this for uterine screening. Um, this is a good way to look for Mullerian abnormalities. And so there's a 3% incidence of Mullerian anomalies overall. We do see higher incidences of that, particularly with um, recurrent pregnancy loss. The most uh, common issue there being uh, septate uterus, which is uh, associated with a number of obstetric complications. But just to see a spectrum of the types of issues we can see with this, you know, these are all uh, 3D ultrasounds showing various types of Mullerian anomalies uh, from a didelphic uterus, where you have two separate uterine bodies that failed to fuse, to a bicornuate uterus, where we have two separate uterine cavities and a defect in the fundus here, to uh, a couple of different images of septums, an arcuate uterus, a unicornuate uterus. And so there are a lot of different ways we see uh, uteruses fail to form Normally, most of these will be asymptomatic, uh, and again, there'll be a 3% incidence of these roughly uh, in the general population, but uh, they can certainly have a, a spectrum of implications on reproductive health. Uh, sonohistorography, we mentioned, is kind of an add-on to a transvaginal sonogram. Uh, this is, again, just a, a normal uterus where you can see the uterine cavity has been distended, and so now we get a little more imaging of the, that uh, endometrial margin of the uterus. Again, this is an office-based procedure. It's fairly inexpensive. It's fairly well tolerated, and it's going to give us superior diagnostic uh, ability to, to find polyps, uh, submucous myomas, and intrauterine adhesions. Um, here's some examples of those. You can see a polyp up here. These are just benign growths of endometrium, or I should say most commonly benign growths of endometrium. That um, you know, if I'm just doing a 2D ultrasound, this patient just looks like she has a thickened endometrium. Maybe I can see that little shadow of a polyp there, but it becomes very clear when we put saline in. Uh, this would be a fibroid. You can see that looks uh, fairly similar to a large polyp, but we can see how a fibroid can distort the uterine cavity. Fibroids are incredibly common. Up to 70% of women have them. Many times they're asymptomatic, but depending on their size, their location, the number, uh, they're a spectrum of uh, clinical symptoms that can um, result. Certainly pain is very common, abnormal bleeding, heavy bleeding, um, intermenstrual bleeding, all very common with that. And there can be a spectrum of fertility implications of fibroids also. We don't always have to remove these, but anything that's uh, distorting the cavity like this uh, will certainly need to be uh, removed. And then this last uh, set of images shows some intrauterine adhesions. You can see kind of a band of adhesions connecting the anterior and posterior uterine walls there. These commonly re result from surgical trauma or infectious issues, or both. Uh, a lot come from um, uh, uterine curatages that follow obstetric complications, um, you know, retained products of conception after a miscarriage or pregnancy termination, um, and uh, just the inflammation, particularly in an obstetric setting, is kind of classic for, um, for causing adhesions. Um, and that will often be associated with menstrual symptoms, altered bleeding, abnormal bleeding, or sometimes absent bleeding. Uh, moving to tubal evaluation, uh, there are a couple ways we can look at that. Um, with history, you know, a patient with a prior 
uh, sexually transmitted infection history or, or pelvic inflammatory disease uh, history will certainly be at risk for this. Patients with endometriosis uh, should certainly be considered for this or other types of pelvic or tubal surgery in the past. Prior ectopic pregnancy is certainly a risk for this. Uh, there are different points in the tube that can be um, affected, whether proximal where it joins the uterus, intrinsic to more of the length of the tube, or distal tube, and so how we're going to approach um, that uh, from a therapeutic standpoint will vary. But again, these are going to be our, our three common ways of addressing that, the HSG, a hysterosalpingo contrast sonogram, or laparoscopy. The HSG is a classic test a lot of us have probably heard of. Uh, it's um, relatively sensitive for tubal pathology. It gives us a nice x-ray outline of the caliber of the tube. It shows us the general architecture of the uterus. If we're lucky, it might pick up polyps or other uh, intrauterine um, filling defects. But um, it's an x-ray-based test. We do them in our office. I'll say it's relatively well um, tolerated, but it's not terribly comfortable. This is something that uh, I'd say a lot of patients, um, this is one of their least favorite things we do to them, but it's a quick test and it's a very valuable test. Uh, there is also a potential therapeutic value. Um, the way we flush the tubes with contrast is associated with an improvement in fertility rates for about three months following the test, uh, which certainly can be of value to some patients. We do have um, an ultrasound way to look at tubal patency. The hycosi that we mentioned is essentially an add-on to a sonohistogram. Um, not as sensitive for tubal factor, but, um, but I think it can be valuable when it works. It involves putting an uh, air bubble medium uh, into the uterus that we can see uh, moving through the fallopian tubes. Here's a still frame that kind of shows you the little uh, white patterns of, of air bubbles moving into the uh, tubal cornua bilaterally. Um, relatively well, well tolerated, and again, if you're already doing a sonohistogram, uh, a nice way that we can evaluate the tubes. Um, and I'll just say, uh, kind of thinking about ultrasound overall, you know, it's, it's a great way to look at the uterus. It looks at the uterine cavity. Now we can look at the tube. Certainly we can move on and look at the ovaries. You can really get a nice comprehensive picture of reproductive anatomy with, uh, you know, transvaginal ultrasound and its add-ons that I, I think is, um, uh, you know, make, makes it a, a very valuable tool to us uh, clinically. The pictures here of uh, hydrosalpinx, which you can see ultrasonographically, kind of a dilated tubal, um, uh, structure that has a pretty typical appearance, and so again, ultrasound can be useful for diagnosing that without having to go to an HSG. Uh, laparoscopy, um, I think a lot of people um, uh, may think of that as a diagnostic test. Sometimes we'll use it as a diagnostic test, but it's not typically recommended for just routine diagnostic uh, uh, evaluation with otherwise unexplained infertility. Uh, certainly in women that are suspicious or have a known history of endometriosis, uh, it can be valuable as it gives us, you know, a direct look at reproductive structures, peritoneal structures, uh, the external surface of the tubes, the interface of the tubal fimbri and the ovaries uh, that we just can't get by any other sort of um, imaging modality. Uh, pelvic adhesions um, may show up with an HSG, but certainly we get a superior view looking at these structures directly with laparoscopy. Uh, we can get, do a procedure called a chromoperturbation where we put a dilute solution of methylene blue through the tubes at the time of surgery to functionally do an intraoperative form of, um, of an HSG. And so that way we can confirm tubal patency at the time of surgery, and that can give us real-time feedback when we're doing surgery to repair damaged tubes to make sure tubes are patent at the conclusion of our procedures. And so laparoscopy also is going to have a therapeutic advantage that we can treat these issues, endometriosis, adhesions, et cetera, uh, in real time as we identify them. And then uh, looking at how we evaluate the ovaries, I think there are two different metrics we may think of with ovarian function, one being ovarian reserve, which we've uh, previously alluded to, and then ovulation testing, the way we can look at um, um, you know, whether or not ovulation is occurring. Uh, probably the most common current ways we look at ovarian reserve are going to be anti-mullerian hormone, antrophollicle count, and then the early follicular um, FSH and estradiol measurements. Uh, ovulation is measured by a number of ways. Some uh, can be monitored at home by the patient. Others can be mo monitored by us in the clinic. So we'll uh, go over that here shortly. But to talk about ovarian reserve, uh, first, that re uh, relates to the number of oocytes that are remaining uh, in the ovary. And so again, how we talked about 
you're born with every egg you'll ever have, that just declines over time. Ovarian reserve is kind of the way we can quantify that in a clinically um, meaningful way. Uh, it does certainly correlate with age, but there's a lot of variability. And so that's just something where, you know, just because you're 25, just because you're 35, just because you're 45, there'll be a correlation with what I expect an ovarian reserve to look like, but it's not that that's at all a guarantee. So this is always a metric we like to look at. Um, this is just looking at quantity of eggs. Quantity may be related to quality in a sense, but again, um, you know, we'll, we'll always expect quality re relating to genetic competency to be more of an age-related factor more than an ovarian reserve-related factor. Uh, the goal of ovarian reserve testing is to add prognostic information to our counseling and treatment planning, um, but um, there are a lot of things that um, this doesn't tell us. It should not be used to turn away patients from treatment. Um, and so I think just, again, making sure that both we and our patients understand what ovarian reserve testing means and what it doesn't mean will be important. Uh, AMH is probably the most common uh, test we use currently. It can be drawn at any time in the cycle. It's a hormone produced by granulosa cells. It's FSH independent. Um, so in general, I think it's a very easy test to get, uh, commonly at a first patient visit. Uh, it may be suppressed with uh, chronic birth control use. Uh, it will be more sensitive than uh, early follicular FSH measurements. And there's a high correlation between that and, and antropolical counts that adds a lot of value to AMH testing. Um, just some pearls to think about with ovarian reserve testing, uh, uh, the AMH and then also antropolical count if you're doing an ultrasound are going to be the simplest, most sensitive and specific measures of ovarian reserve. These essentially um, predict oocyte yield uh, with ART. And so I think that's just something that, you know, a lot of our patients are going to be thinking about different types of options we can give them. And that's really what ovarian reserve most accurately predicts. And so it's not something that predicts reproductive potential, particularly by other um, types of treatments. And so again, just thinking about what AMH tells us, what antropolical count tells us, and what they don't. Um, they do not tell us uh, with infertility the, the likelihood of pregnancy. If a woman has a low or undetectable AMH but is still having regular cycles, th that doesn't have a direct correlation to her chance of uh, conception. It doesn't tell us um, the likelihood of pregnancy with ovarian stimulation and IUI for couples with unexplained infertility. Um, and there's only a very weak association with um, clinical pregnancy rates, live birth rates, things like that. And so again, beyond just the, uh, say, pregnancy rate with IVF, which may relate to the number of oocytes retrieved once pregnant, uh, the advancement of pregnancy miscarriage rates are, are very weakly associated with measures of ovarian reserve. And ovulation testing is kind of how we look at the function of the ovary. Uh, this is going to be very common. Again, things like PCOS are going to fall into um, this umbrella. And I think, uh, again, the menstrual, the menstrual history is a very important way uh, we can first start this conversation. Women with regular cycles, uh, 21 to 35 days that have normal menstrual flow that's consistent, it's predictable, uh, accompanied by a predictable spectrum of symptoms, are typically going to be ovulatory. Women that are not ovulatory typically have very irregular cycles uh, that are going to be unpredictable, more infrequent. Um, it's not always the case, but I think recognizing those trends is important when, when we're first encountering a patient. And then there are a number of tests we can do to add on to this, um, you know, ranging from menstrual histories. Patients can monitor cervical mucus changes. They can monitor LH in their urine at home, uh, basal body temperatures. Uh, and then clinically, we can measure uh, progesterone uh, in the blood uh, during the mid-luteal phase, or we can use ultrasound monitoring to um, assess ovulation. Um, I will just note L LH should be um, positive between one and two days prior to ovulation for patients that are measuring that at home, but that puts a lot of burden on the patient. And so I think that can be a source of stress for patients. You can have false positives in patients that have a, a high rusting LH tone with uh, PCOS, for example. And so, um, so I think typically by the time patients come to us clinically, a lot of times they're expecting us to do more of their ovulation monitoring. But the OPKs, I, I do like in that they give us prospective information. Once you see a peak LH surge, we know that ovulation is getting ready to occur versus a lot of these other things, the BBTs, the progesterone, that only give us retrospective information about ovulation. Uh, and then I will just note a progesterone value. 
uh, for most labs, a value over about three uh, implies ovulation. But whether it's three, whether it's 10, whether it's 22, uh, I wouldn't say typically it's gonna have a lot of clinical value. Progesterone's released in pulses in the luteal phase. You can see very significant fluctuations in progesterone values just over a few hours within a given day of the luteal phase. And so a lot of patients feel like if their progesterone level is only nine or only 11 or whatever, that has some meaning. To me, that just means they ovulated. And so I don't ascribe a lot of value to the absolute number of a positive luteal progesterone measurement. Uh, and then, of course, some common causes of ovulation dysfunction. We've briefly mentioned PCOS, uh, some pictures here of the common string of pearls appearance we'll see on ultrasound, uh, obesity, other weight changes, either uh, uh, weight gain, weight loss, hypothalamic issues, strenuous exercise, um, ovarian insufficiency, perimenopause, other endocrinopathies, chronic medical issues, medications. So a lot of different things that can affect reproductive signaling in general can compromise ovulation. So um, you know, in our um, both history taking as well as the workup we do, we'll want to keep these sorts of issues in mind for any patient that seems to have an issue with ovulation function. Okay, with that, we'll move to how we treat it, how we make uh, infertility better, how we can help these uh, women and couples conceive. Uh, so there are four primary goals of how we manage infertility, um, you know, kind of as we've been talking about. If we can identify the specific causes of infertility when possible, when present, um, you know, with proper evaluation, with uh, treatments designed, to uh, address the issues we encounter, the majority of couples can successfully uh, conceive. So uh, that can be very rewarding, certainly on a clinical standpoint, to help couples overcome these barriers that we identify. Um, a very big part of our job is education. Uh, it's never been as true as it is uh, during the COVID pandemic, of course, but in general, a lot of women are first turning to the internet, to their friends, to social media for information on fertility, and there's a lot of, um, questionable information out there. And so I think that's something we kind of have to meet patients where they are at their first visit and see what sort of knowledge we have to unlearn from them uh, when we're first setting off on our journey together. Uh, infertility is incredibly stressful. Uh, there's a lot of classic data that the psychological burden of infertility is equivalent to a diagnosis of cancer or HIV. And I think um, you know, just kind of the existential threat that uh, infertility poses is something that uh, every of our patients has in some degree. Uh, there's a 40% incidence of clinically diagnosable anxiety or depression at the time of uh, initial fertility uh, consultation. And so this is something that all of our patients um, should have addressed and, and just along uh, during their treatment, we need to make sure we're providing em uh, appropriate emotional support. And then finally, of course, we have to acknowledge not all of our patients are gonna have successful treatment. And so just to make sure that um, Regardless of that, we're, we're helping them to either cope with treatment failure and bring their journey to a close or, or look towards um, non-traditional options, things like gamete donation, um, adoption, or uh, foster care, whatever um, other options they may want to look for if we're not able to help them in a, in a medical setting, uh, just to make sure that we, we help our patients to cope with their infertility, even if that doesn't mean taking home a baby at the end of the process. Um, we should briefly mention diet and lifestyle because these will always be important considerations. Uh, all our women trying to conceive should be on a prenatal vitamin with at least 400 micrograms of folic acid. Uh, we want them to follow a healthy diet and lifestyle factors, though there is not a superior diet that's been consistently supported in our literature. Um, it's great to have a normal BMI, BMI prior to conception. Of course, that's not always a goal we can successfully achieve, but we like to shoot for it when we can. Smoking cessation is uh, extremely important for both partners, limiting alcohol, limiting caffeine, limiting exposure to potential endocrine disruptors and air pollution, and then thinking about other chronic medical issues, medications that patients may be on, just to make sure we're setting it up for successful conception and successful pregnancy once that occurs. Uh, beyond that, there are really only two ways to treat infertility, and this is one of the things I really like about my job, is it's extremely easy. Um, the first is just fix the issue, right? And so if we can um, uh, identify what the problem is, fix it. You know, if you're not ovulating, start ovulating. You know, I mean, there, there's some things that are just a very simple uh, flip of a switch that for many patients um, with added time may very well lead to successful conception. 
not always the case. And so uh, there are times we have to cheat and kind of get around the laws of nature a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. But uh, for the things we can fix, again, we mentioned the lifestyle factors. Um, if you're smoking, stop smoking. That makes my job easier. I mean, it's just something where there are a lot of things that can be improved, optimized, not necessarily uh, made perfect, but that we can do to improve the chance within a given month that they're not uh, additional adverse factors working against us. Most of these things we talked about before that cause infertility can be clinically addressed in some way. Um, you know, abnormal sperm parameters, maybe we can look at insemination, uh, tubal factor, maybe we can fix with surgery, endometriosis, maybe we can excise with surgery. A lot of the uterine factors will be amenable to surgery. It's important to note that we can't fix everything. You know, people that have very severe male factor, uh, non-obstructive azospermia, genetic factors leading to azospermia, uh, certain tubal issues that have been long, uh, long existing from chronic pelvic inflammatory disease, um, uterine factors uh, that are full of fibroids or severe Asherman syndrome, um, really nasty cases of endometriosis. There's some congenital anomalies that don't have a surgical correction. Certainly as we're running out of eggs, I don't have a cure for that. Diminished reserve, ovarian failure uh, are very difficult to address um, in a uh, easy way. And then we don't have a cure for age. We don't have a cure for genetic factors. And so some of these things that are just um, kind of inherent to the couple situation, we don't necessarily have a way to easily manage. But um, to kind of run through some of the things we can do clinically, um, for male factor, uh, again, there are kind of two ways I would say we can easily address that. One is refer to reproductive urology. And let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into male factor, into the medical factors, endocrine factors, lifestyle factors that may be compromising sperm parameters with the goal of making sperm parameters better. If we have a mild male factor that may be compromising conception rates, if we can make sperm numbers better so that we have a more efficient delivery of modal sperm, to the upper reproductive tract with ovulation, that may be all a couple needs. Uh, similarly, we can do intrauterine insemination. And so uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with that. That's where we actually place sperm into the uterus. If you look at numbers of sperm that make it from the vagina to the tube, less than 1% of modal sperm actually make it up with intercourse. And so with IUI, we can get a much more effective delivery of modal sperm that can either be using fresh or frozen sperm, can either be with partner sperm or donor sperm. So there's some different ways we can do that. Um, here's just kind of a picture to show you what it looks like. It's a pretty easy procedure, not too much more complicated than a pap smear from the patient's standpoint. With couples with male factors, success rates will probably approach 5 to 10% per cycle. So it's not that it's a terribly effective treatment, but uh, it still can be effective for overcoming more mild cases of male factor. And single women or women in same-sex couples, therapeutic insemination with donor sperm uh, may lead to higher success rates, maybe approaching 20% per cycle. Uh, and of course, when we're evaluating couples for IUI, we need to consider other effects of age, tubal factor, uterine issues. So it's not that there's only going to be one factor that we need to consider in a given couple's care. And we'll commonly um, uh, offer empiric ovarian stimulation to add a little bit of an extra push to the ovary, potentially leading to multiple follicular recruitment with this treatment, uh, although we have to be careful with uh, multiple pregnancy anytime we're doing that for these patients. Uh, just to briefly talk about uterine factor, these are the things we can fix. So uh, these are all different surgeries. We can take polyps out hysteroscopically. Uh, most uterine septums can be surgically repaired. Uh, many cases of intrauterine adhesions can be corrected surgically. And then a lot of our fibroids uh, can be repaired or removed uh, either via hysteroscopy, laparoscopy, or uh, open surgery. And again, that'll just depend on their size, number, and location. But generally, uh, these can be very rewarding surgeries if you successfully repair a uterine factor. For many couples, that may be all they need to successfully conceive. Similarly, there are a number of uh, surgeries we can do for tubal factor, uh, ranging from proximal and distal uh, tubal repairs to lysing pelvic adhesions, excising or cauterizing endometriosis uh, with the goal of restoring normal anatomy and normal tubal function as it relates to uh, its ability to pick up eggs at the time of ovulation. Again, when these go well, they can be very effective for um, helping patients conceive moving forward. Uh, with the ovarian factor, uh, particularly the patients that aren't ovulating or aren't ovulating reliably, uh, we have a couple ways we can induce ovulation. 
Uh, clomiphene citrate's been around for decades, uh, certainly a very well-known agent for inducing ovulation. Letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor that's been used more recently for ovulation induction as an off-label indication. Um, it uh, is something I'd say we've probably been using about 20 years now, but we've got a, a great body of data now showing clinical equivalent equivalency to Clomid, and for a lot of patients, we'll see that it's better tolerated. There is some um, good data recently that it may be superior for inducing ovulation and leading to pregnancy, specifically head-to-head um, -head against Clomid for women with PCOS. So for a lot of us, it's becoming first-line treatment for many of our patients. Typical conception rates will be in the low double digits per cycle with multiples rates uh, usually under 10%. So um, that's important to keep in mind with our counseling. We can also induce ovulation with gonadotropins. These would be injectable. Uh, for many women, we just use FSH for that. Uh, we can also use a combined um, menotropin that has both FSH and LH activity. Uh, this will lead to slightly higher pregnancy rates and considerably higher multiples rates. So I won't say it's something we do quite as frequently as you, we used to, given the availability of other modern alternatives, but it can be effective for patients with hypothalamic amenorrhea uh, or resistance to oral agents alone. And then uh, we'll reframe that. So the other way we, um, the other way we treat infertility uh, is with ART, and this is something where when we can't really overcome the barrier with some of these, what I might call easier options we've discussed, ART gives us the ability to uh, help couples conceive via more advanced uh, approaches. Uh, ART includes IVF, but uh, other uh, types of treatment where basically eggs and embryos are handled outside of the human body. And so if you've heard of ICSI, which is a fertilization technique, uh, embryo cryopreservation, uh, third-party um, services like um, embryo donation, egg donation, uh, gestational surrogacy, all of these kind of fall under the umbrella of ART and can be successful uh, for different indications in helping couples conceive. Um, IVF, just to kind of show you a quick diagram of how it works, we give women medications to simulate multiple eggs to grow. Those are retrieved in the office through a vaginal procedure. Eggs are fertilized in the laboratory cultured into embryos and most commonly transferred at the blastocyst stage, which occurs five to six days um, after retrieval. Um, it's been around for a little over 40 years now. We've got over 8 million live births worldwide from IVF at this point. Over 2% of all births in the United States are currently um, occurring from IVF. In 2019, we had a little over 77,000. Uh, it actually dropped for the first time in 2020 thanks to COVID. We did have a decreased utilization uh, that year due to uh, the COVID pandemic. But uh, that's IVF in a nutshell. There are a lot of different reasons we do IVF. It was first designed for treatment of tubal factor, but it's something that has applications for male factor. Uh, for many patients, it'll be first line for endometriosis. Uh, ovulatory dysfunction patients that don't uh, conceive with oral agents, uh, patients that need oocyte donation or gestational carriers, uh, we use it for fertility preservation, patients that need genetic testing prior to pregnancy, and it can be effective for unexplained infertility. Um, you may remember earlier we mentioned a list of factors that we can't easily treat um, with uh, conservative efforts, and, and kind of comparing these two lists, um, you know, there's really a role for ART to accommodate all of them. And so that's something where, you know, I think we really have to look at what a couple's situation is and whether or not there's a role for ART in their care, because even the most, um, you know, advanced hurdles we face clinically can typically be overcome um, with one or more ART procedures. Um, this is 2019 data, just showing um, national outcomes. Uh, this is uh, a slide I like to look at because it shows live births per new patient. So for new patients um, presenting to IVF clinics in the United States in 2019, you can see the numbers here. So we're talking about tens of thousands of patients. Um, you can see the live birth rates they had from IVF. And so I think you can really see um, how valuable this treatment can be. Live birth rates approaching 69% in our youngest patients uh, and kind of trending down as women get older. 
You can see twinning rates are minimal. Current treatments uh, tend to have twinning rates in the mid to low single digits, which is excellent. Uh, for most of our patients, they should have lower uh, rates of twinning with IVF now than they would with ovarian stimulation with clomid or letrozole. So I think you could argue IVF being uh, certainly more successful and for many patients uh, safer, uh, particularly when you factor in the multiples rate. And so this is kind of a current profile of live birth rates uh, with IVF. Um, this is just one add-on to IVF that's relatively new that I wanted to mention uh, where we can start looking at age in a new way. And I had mentioned before that we see increasing oocyte aneuploidy that affects uh, conception rates and miscarriage rates. We can test embryos for that prior to pregnancy with IVF now. And so you can see the rate of embryo aneuploidy as it increases with age, but that's not to say that women in their late 30s and 40s can't make normal embryos. This is a recent example from our own office. Uh, we tested six embryos. You can see four were abnormal, uh, but these two highlighted in yellow are genetically normal. And I think the value of this, um, you know, to look at this patient as a, um, as a case, you know, had she been treated 10 years ago before we were routinely using this, she probably would have had a single embryo transfer of this first embryo in her um, probably fresh cycle, it would have failed. It was a monosomy 16 that's not compatible with life. She would have come back for a frozen embryo transfer uh, a month later. We probably would have transferred two because she was upset the first one didn't work. Both of these were monosomies for different chromosomes. It would have failed. She would have been sad. She would have come back for another transfer, probably again doing a double embryo transfer. But in this case, she would have gotten Particularly unlucky, we would have transferred two euploid embryos, and she probably would have had at least a 50% chance of twins with that. Um, if you go back way uh, into the past, we might have transferred all three of these, and embryo number six would have had Turner syndrome. So, um, so I think that's just something, too, of being able to have this insight into an embryo's competency prior to pregnancy has really changed our modern approach to um, embryo transfer planning, embryo preservation, uh, fertility preservation, future fertility planning that we can do now uh, in ways we didn't um, have access to before. Uh, finally, I just want to mention uh, unexplained infertility quickly. This is um, a large percentage of our patients, up to 30% of couples may have unexplained infertility where uh, everything looks normal with their workup. And so just how we should manage these patients, how we should not manage these patients, ASRM has a great guideline that came out um, uh, I think about two years ago that goes over these patients in detail is a really a nice uh, summary of our literature. But I, I think it's important to put, point out unexplained infertility for most patients should be managed either with Clomid or Letrozole and IUI first line. Typically, they recommend doing that for at least three or four cycles. If that's unsuccessful, IVF should be the next step. Uh, for women that are a little older, 38 and above, typically IVF would likely be uh, a better first-line treatment for them, and there's evidence to support that. But over here, we see a list of therapies that are not recommended. They're specifically recommended against things like Clomid and intercourse, Letrozole and intercourse, gonadotropins and intercourse, you know, a lot of these things that we commonly do or a lot of people do, you're infertile, here, take some Clomid for a few months and call me if you're not pregnant. ASRM specifically recommends against that because it's not more effective than no treatment alone. And so I think for patients that have a normal workup, it's all the more important that they be referred to us sooner rather than later so that we can manage them with IUI treatment uh, or IVF when indicated. And so in conclusion, uh, I just had three quick takeaways. One, again, infertility is a disease. I think, uh, you know, it's a clinically meaningful event for our patients. It causes great distress. Uh, it, there are medical factors behind it. It is a discordance of your dreams and your reality. It certainly affects the quality of life you have, and there are meaningful ways we can manage it. Um, time is is rarely our friend in this field. I'd always rather see a patient sooner rather than later, even if we don't necessarily jump into treatments right away. Uh, I have never been upset at seeing a patient sooner in her journey rather than later. It is very hard to turn back the clock uh, once time has passed. And then I'll just close with a uh, favorite John Lennon quote. There's nothing you can do that can't be done. I think that's a, a good mantra to have in this field. For most of our patients, there is a path to successful pregnancy. Um, 
there may be some rules that have to be broken, and a lot of times that may challenge patients on an ethical front, on a moral front, financially, but uh, for most patients, depending on how uh, aggressive they're willing to pursue these goals, there should be a way to help them grow their family. Uh, that's all I've got, guys, so I appreciate your attention. Happy to take any questions. <coughs> Very good. Very complicated. Good question. One as endocrinologists, we do our part of the evaluation. Some of them are trying to push for us to do something. When I say we have to say, oh yeah, you can't go beyond this. Luckily, I don't start filming or anything. Mainly because of that concern of know, the uh, multiple segments at this point, I feel like that's all yeah. But um, I had one piece of patient recently say, perhaps a progesterone injection, like for implantation or something, is suggesting, which I've heard of it before, mm -hmm. uh, but I've never seen it. And this is a patient that's uh, on metformin now, so I was wondering about that. Yeah. Um, and just to repeat, I'm, I'm not sure if those of you online could hear that, but Asking about um, how to manage um, infertility in PCOS patients, um, kind of at the endocrinology level prior to referral and whether there are rules for progesterone injections. Um, I, I hate this talk I just gave. There's so many lectures buried within it. I mean, PCOS is its yeah. own talk, and endometriosis, IVF, any of these could have been uh, yes, hour-long talks of their own. But, but with PCOS, I think it's fair to induce ovulation, right? I mean, that's a problem we can fix. Uh, I think most data supports letrozole as first-line treatment, not metformin. Clomid has a role, but I think uh, we do have a meaningful data to support letrozole over Clomid as first-line therapy now. Again, that is off-label, but uh, plenty of safety data to support it now. Um, and I think uh, if we can get patients to ovulate successfully, that's a great first-line treatment, particularly while they're waiting to get in with the reproductive endocrinologists. I know. Um, uh, personally, the wait to see me is five months, and I, I hate that, but uh, that's just something where, you know, just because they call an RE, uh, they're not going to get in uh, right away at most clinics, and so I think to, um, you know, at least have something we can do to give them a meaningful chance of increased pregnancy uh, while they're waiting to get in with a specialist is, is helpful. Uh, progesterone injections are something we may do in an IVF cycle, particularly in frozen transfers where there's no corpus luteum function, but that um, likely wouldn't have a role in uh, PCOS patients who are inducing ovulation. Once they ovulate, they should make their own progesterone, so their corpus luteal function should be normal, assuming we can induce ovulation with oral agents. Those that take gonadotropins may benefit from uh, progesterone supplementation. That can be uh, commonly given vaginally, and so they don't have to do injections for that. But, um, but again, I think it's fair uh, at the endocrine level or for gynecologists to um, uh, induce ovulation if they feel comfortable doing so. There is a risk of twins, and that's whether you do that, whether I do that. I can't make that risk go away, and so that's just important that uh, the patients be counseled. Triplets are still rare with letrozole and Clomid, certainly less than 1%. I'll say in my practice we've only had one case of triplets uh, from oral ovulation induction in all the years we've been doing this. So not that it can't happen, but uh, there's some ways to monitor that we can reduce that risk. Yeah, I mean, like, if you're trying to conceive, stop testosterone, right? If you're trying to conceive, women should stop birth control, men should stop testosterone. And, and I think that analogy uh, is very uh, physiologically accurate, right? And so I think, um, you know, stop it right away, go ahead and get a semen analysis. Some men will still have meaningful spermatogenesis depending on how long they've been on it, depending on the dose they've been on. But stop it right away. Let's go ahead and get a semen analysis right away. There's an identify. oh, I didn't repeat the question, I'm sorry. Uh, patient with PCOS, partners on testosterone, what to do, and so stop testosterone. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I think go ahead and get the semen analysis, knowing that risk for um, male factor, but uh, the time to recovery and the magnitude of recovery will vary. Some men don't recover 
if they've been on longer durations of testosterone and higher doses that have led to testicular atrophy over time. Others will have full recovery. I saw a guy today that had over 100 million modal sperm, previously was fully azospermic. And so with, that took about four months, and I think he was on Clomid to help recover from that. But, um, but with Clomid or HCG injections, uh, a lot of times we can in, uh, induce recovery of spermatogenesis in men that have been on testosterone that don't recover spontaneously. I, I mean, if he wants a baby, he should stop now. Uh, yeah, how do I oh, chat? Oh, cool. Okay, so I'll um, repeat these questions, or I guess y'all can see them. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Archer, um, for your question. <coughs> um, with regards to lifestyle issues, how do you address women who have a BMI over 40? I've read legal marijuana, morbidly obese, and I've read that legal marijuana is several degrees stronger than what is available in the past. Thoughts about strength as well, now that it is legal and certainly, yeah. I, um, yeah, and morbid obesity is, um, I, I guess we might say a controversial issue in our field because um, we can, many of these women can conceive, right? It's not that um, obesity is a contraceptive, um, but they're at a higher rate of obstetric complications. Um, most obstetric complications, uh, miscarriage, prematurity, uh, preterm labor, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, C-section. Um, and I uh, have certainly heard obstetricians complain about patients that we've gotten pregnant with a high BMI that, oh, they had to deal with them. I personally feel that um, people are allowed to get pregnant, and I, um, you know, I, I don't not let people have a consult with me if their weight is a certain number or their BMI is a certain number. At our center, I can't um, put them to sleep with a BMI over 40 at our outpatient center. So I can't do egg retrievals for patients with a high BMI just with the anesthesia group we work with. But there are people that do. And so I think um, you know, for patients with a high BMI, that's just a factor we have to navigate. And you know, can they conceive with non-ART treatments? Uh, I had a same-sex couple today. One partner had a BMI 49, the other BMI 34. And so we talked about reciprocal IVF, where maybe the partner with the healthier BMI could donate eggs that the other partner carry. And so I think that's something that um, you know, the other variable there is time, and so I think BMI uh, has a different uh, weight, pardon the pun, in a 29-year-old versus a 39-year-old, where maybe you've got time to dedicate towards weight loss, potentially including bariatric surgery in younger patients, where in older patients, of course, if we, you know, spend, you know, a year or two losing weight, uh, we're losing ovary at the same time, and so I think that has to be carefully addressed, but I think, um, you know, it's just, it's a thing we, it's one of the factors we counsel about, and I think, um, uh, you know, I'm still happy to work with, with patients that have uh, higher BMIs. Uh, marijuana, um, I, uh, I always discourage, I mean, I think that's just something where our data on that, just because of um, how limited our research is on that, um, is very new, but certainly ASRM supports not using marijuana for both both partners. Um, and I think that's just a fair, I mean, e-cigarettes also fairly new, but uh, we know they don't help fertility. And I think I tend to err on anything that we don't have good data on or that may potentially harm fertility. Let's discontinue prior to uh, our efforts or prior to pregnancy. Um, and uh, last question, or the other question from Dr. Cotwall, um, any hormonal deficiency issues common in male. Um, yeah, I mean, male infertility, again, should be its own lecture, and I apologize that I was just able to give that a slide or two. But I think hypogonadism is uh, common in men. Uh, we see that, I mean, in iatrogenic with testosterone use. Uh, we see that with obesity. Uh, we see um, um, idiopathic hypogonadism in men. I think all those are very common. Um, but, uh, you know, prolactin can suppress uh, spermatogenesis, thyroid dysfunction can suppress spermatogenesis, and so I think that's something that um, here locally we largely depend on our urology partner to work up uh, just because there are a whole spectrum 
of um, endocrine factors that affect male fertility, uh, genetic factors that affect male fertility. And so uh, for male patients, um, it is important when a semen analysis is abnormal that they do have a more thorough workup to help us uh, figure out what can be done to improve sperm parameters or what can be done to obtain the sperm we need for fertility. Anything else I could answer? Sure. Yep. Yeah, uh, I mean, so the question was uh, on AMH and, um, and how it relates to PCOS and how we might interpret that when PCOS is a consideration. And yes, it's absolutely true that AMH levels are higher in PCOS. There's been some debate as to whether AMH could substitute for antral follicle count in our diagnosis of PCOS and where that threshold should be. A lot of people talk about numbers around four or five being a potential cutoff that correlates with polycystic ovarian morphology. Currently, AMH is not a diagnostic criteria for AMH, uh, for PCOS, but we certainly, um, know about that correlation. Higher levels of AMH can correlate with letrozole resistance, and so that's something where, you know, women that have those just really big ovaries full of follicles, you know, an AMH in the high teens, the 20s, the 30s, you know, those are ones that commonly we have to use higher doses of letrozole or may benefit from adjuvant agents to sensitize them to um, drugs like letrozole. But, um, I, uh, it's not cycle dependent, so you can measure AMH any time, and I think uh, when we see those higher values, either that patient is going to be an ovulatory patient with polycystic morphology, or that patient could very well have PCOS. So I think it's uh, certainly a factor we look at. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I um so the question was what data do we have on fulfillment utilization in men with um uh with uh, hypogonadism and you know of course what outcome are we measuring right so we're looking at some sort of meaningful improvement in sperm parameters or pregnancy rates. And I think that's just kind of uh, the thing in, in our field. We try to measure pregnancy, live birth uh, as outcomes as much as we can. Uh, but many men with um, uh, hypogonadism uh, not rooted at the testicular level uh, may benefit from Clomid or other uh, agents like HCG injections um, to improve spermatogenesis. Uh, I don't have a specific number I can give you. I think that's something that we kind of have to take case by case. But I think um, a lot of um, you know men that don't have the hypergonadotropic hypogonadism will respond to Clomid. It's obviously inexpensive, generally well tolerated, and certainly the um, you know clinical value we see in improving sperm parameters that may take a guy who previously would have needed ICSI for IVF to where he's now a better candidate for insemination. And at least we can give that uh, an effort before we um, pursue IVF with them. I think that can be seen in a meaningful way. I don't really have a specific number I can give you because there, there will be just so much patient variability on that. Um, anything else I can answer? Okay. Thanks, guys.